Hello, everyone, and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn. I'm Christina. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are part of the nightlife team at Cal Academy in San Francisco. Nightlife is our weekly Thursday night events where we mix science with cocktails, live music, and more. Night School is our virtual version where we send a little taste of nightlife to you back at home. I am currently live from the Academy. You can check out my background. Uh, this is our second week IRL, and we'll be back on select Thursdays here on out. So come by and hang out if you get the chance. I think I saw a lot of Californians in the chat, so hopefully you could come by. Uh, before you ask, night school will still be around for those who aren't able to trek over to the Bay Area. And tonight, um, in celebration of our newest exhibit, Sharks, which officially opens tomorrow, uh, tonight's session will be all about, you guessed it, sharks, um, but specifically some Jaws and Maws. All right, so first up, we have Dave Catania, the Academy's Collection Manager of Ichthyology. And he's going to show you just a tiny, tiny fraction of some of the Academy's Ichthyology collections and show off some of his favorite shark specimens. Um, so that's going to be great, as always, when you get to look into our collections. Um, Dr. Sora Kim is an assistant professor at UC Merced. Um, she studies ancient shark teeth, which contain clues to the ecology and oceanography of Arctic and Antarctic waters during the Eocene. And then finally, um, some sharks don't have exactly have exactly have what you would call teeth. Um, they're filter feeders. So Dr. Misty Peg Tran studies the mechanics of how really large sharks um, filter feed so well and why they're so cool, despite the lack of teeth. All sharks are cool. Um, as always, tonight's program is live, so continue saying hi um, in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, hi to anyone watching at Science Today in the building. Um, let us know if it's your first time or your night school regular, and we'll have Q&As after everyone's talk, so make sure to get your questions in. Um, we will now turn it to Dave in the collections room. But what I'd like to give you is just okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to night school. Um, this evening we'll be talking about sharks. It's um, quite a topic, and we'll only be able to barely scratch the surface in the in the time we've got available here. But what I'd like to give you is just some idea of how diverse this group is, from size. Um, dentition, reproductive habits, um, all of that. They're uh, quite an amazing um, group of fishes. Um, first, let's deal with size. Um, the largest fish in the ocean, in the world for that matter, is um, the whale shark, Rhynchodon typus. They get up to 45 feet in length. That's about as long as an airport or bus. Um, they're not uh, by any means the largest thing in the ocean. I mean, that title goes to the blue shark, and blue whale, I mean, pardon me, um, that's pushing 80 feet long, the skeleton of which is hanging up um, at the academy. Um, anyway, um, and the next largest shark is called the basking shark, um, Cetomimus maximus. And I happen to have um, a basking shark jaw here that I'm gonna pull up. But first, I want to let you know that um, both the whale shark and the basking shark are filter feeders. So they're not um, active predators. And you can really see that in the dentition. So hold on a second. This is a rather distorted jaw. Let's see how the camera does it here. But um, you can see the teeth here. I think I'm going to disconnect the camera from its base. And we'll see if I can get a close-up view here. These are the teeth. They're, as you can see, they're just small nubs. Um, so this, this shark is not one that would ever even consider biting you. 
um, whale sharks and basking sharks, you'll see divers with them from time to time. But the only thing that could happen to you there is if they inadvertently whack you with their tail, which could send you for a bit of a loop. But anyway, this is um, basking shark. This particular one, that jaw, that jaw was from one that measured about 25 feet long and was estimated at two or three tons. I'm not really sure about uh, sure about that. See. Getting back to size, at the other end of the spectrum, we've got actually the world's smallest shark um, is only about, uh, it does, doesn't get any longer than eight inches. We don't have any specimens of that particular one. It's a lantern shark called it Mopterus perii, but we do have a, a different one here. Um, Aerodactinus radcliffii, and this is what they look like. Let's see if I can get this here. This is um, pretty much full grown. Um, these are the the largest one ever found is just I think about nine and a half inches in length. So these are this is kind of the two ends of the spectrum. Uh, Sharks that are under 10 inches and one <laughs> that reaches 45 feet. Um, it's quite a quite a diverse group. Now let's see. Um, we we'll get we we'll get into some more dentition in a little bit here. Um, I'd like to talk about reproduction. Now sharks have several different ways they reproduce. Um, there are species where the female lays egg capsules and um, there's different configurations of them and there are actually uh, two species of horn shark off um, western north and south america they the range overlaps in the middle around baja and it's um heterodontus francisci the one we have up in california here that extends down into baja and then heterodontus mexicanus which goes from Baja down into South America. They have interesting egg capsules with this spiral ornamentation on them. And in kind of a rare display of um, parental care, what the female will do is bite the egg case at the end. And then with those ridges, it will actually screw it into a crevice um, so that hopefully it'll stay there and be um, less available to predators. What I'm pulling out here is an egg capsule of Heterodontus franciscanus. This is the one that uh, occurs up here. You can kind of see the, the way that, that ridge spirals. So this is an, it's an interesting egg capsule. And then the one from the, the species further to the south, um, This is uh, Heterodontus mexicanus. This one also has spiral ridges. And um, it also has these tassels. So it, this can also help entangle it. Uh, this is something you see a lot in, in some other uh, species where the uh, egg capsule is entangled in um, seaweed or uh, just to keep it um, hidden. But those are both horn sharks. And there's a brown cat shark that we have in this area. And this is an egg capsule from that. And I also have a, a specimen of this species. This is what the brown cat shark looks like. Oh, yeah. 
It's got our specimen tag number on it. That's the catalog number. And the egg capsule, there are some smaller ones in here. This configuration, these are called, um, actually, uh, they're commonly called mermaids' purses. Um, there's three of them there. There's actually another one in the jar. But these are um, these sharks that I've been showing you lay eggs. And then the eggs, um, the, the embryos inside with a yolk sac that nourishes it. And then just like, just like a, a chicken egg, um, when the embryo is ready, it will um, it, it'll escape from the capsule uh, and uh, begin, begin its life as a free swimming shark. Now, there are other sharks um, to actually kind of save the young from predation is they will create eggs, but they will be retained in the female until they hatch. And then once they hatch, the female gives live birth. Um, so that's called ovoviviparous. Um, the egg-laying ones are just called oviparous. And then at the um, other end of the spectrum, you've got actually embryos in the uterus that have a placental attachment um, and draw nourishment from the mother. Um, it's histologically probably different than a mammalian placenta, but it provides the nourishment. And it usually attaches in the um, some of these juvenile sharks. Um, blue sharks are, are among them. Uh, there are several, several uh, groups that um, have live birth. And the um, uh, umbilical cord comes in between the pectoral fins. And on some juveniles, you can actually see a little umbilical scar so it's basically a shark's belly button, uh, to, to use the, the human term. Um, and there are also uh, some, some sharks that it's called aplacental viviparity. And they don't have a placenta, but the embryos in the uterus are actually nourished by eggs that the female ovulates. And that provides the food. Um, also, another thing that happens in the uterus is you will have embryos eating each other. So actually, at birth, it's already survival of the fittest. Uh, so their, their reproduction is, is uh, pretty interesting. They've uh, got a number of options there <laughs> that they've evolutionarily tried. Easy way. Clear the deck for the next thing. I'd like to look um, a little bit at dentition here, and I'm going to disconnect the camera from its mount. But actually, I can bring up some other uh, shark jaws here first. Let me just get a cloth down here. Uh, this one. This jaw, you can see those nasty looking teeth. This is a jaw from a short fin mako. Um, this is one of the fastest fish in the ocean. Um, it's the fastest shark. Um, it can swim at a speed of, a burst of speed up to 45 miles an hour, which is pretty astounding. Um, the only other fishes that really go that fast are tunas. Um, they're, they're incredibly fast. I mean, 45 miles an hour underwater is, to my way of thinking, um, well, pretty equivalent to 70 on the, in the terrestrial environment that a cheetah can hit, um, just because of the difference in the drag differential. Anyway, these are, this is uh, Isiris oxyrhynchus, the short fin makeup. Now, this is an interesting one. Now that I've got the alcohol dried there. This will stand out a little better, I think. Um, let's see. Now, these teeth here, it, it looks like a bandsaw. Uh, it's pretty, pretty interesting. This is a jaw from a sleeper shark. 
and I'll show you, I'm going to flip it and show you the teeth in the lower jaw. They're very different. Um, these are a lot pointier. And the, and the other ones, these, they said, look like a bandsaw. And that's exactly what they do. Um, sleeper sharks will bite prey. And these um, lower jaw teeth that are pointier will actually keep the prey in place. And these bandsaw-like teeth actually can be moved back and forth by the jaw and actually saw and um, cut the prey up into smaller pieces. Um, pretty, pretty interesting dentition. This is a sleeper shark. Let's see what the data are here. This one was 12 feet long and it was caught off of, in Humboldt County back in uh, 1964. <laughs> And for just a different type of dentition here, this is a um, pair of set of jaws from a seven gill shark. This is also, this is a local species. Again, there's um, a little bit of difference there in, in, the, uh, in the upper and lower, particularly in the center here. And uh, I'm going to disconnect the camera from its mount here, so things are going to get a little bit shaky on that camera. And what I want to show you is um, tiger shark jaws. This is, uh, let's see what it looks like there. There we go. That's the whole jaw. And if we get closer to the teeth, and again, for sharks, you can see all of the, the rows of teeth going back down into the jaw as these teeth on the outside and the outer edge here um, get damaged and break off, um, there's always replacement teeth ready to move into position. This is true of all sharks. It's uh, pretty amazing. Dave, can they create, um, like, do they have unlimited teeth? Do they keep creating more as they, as they continue life? Yes, they do. They, there's just continuous supply of, of teeth that are generated in the jaw um, can, all the time. Yeah, it's pretty pretty amazing. Uh, let's see, I've got a jaw down here. Uh, this is a white shark jaw. I think what I'm going to do is um, disconnect the camera again. There we go. Um, this is the, the whole jaw. And again, you see that that, uh, that characteristic serrated tooth is kind of triangular in shape. And again, you can see the um, replacement teeth down into the jaw. This, this shark was also, this white shark was also uh, a little over 12 feet long and weighed about 640 pounds. Now, there's one I want to show you. Actually, I need to flip this over on the other side. And this, the one I'm about to show you is called a frill shark. And it is a very primitive shark, very long and eel-like, which um, actually the uh, species name, Anguinius, uh, kind of indicates it's, um, it's eel-like. Um, it's long and slender, but it has amazing dentition. And the specimen that I've got in this plastic tub over here um, is actually the first record for California. Um, prior to that specimen, which was collected in 1948, um, the species, the frill shark species, was never known in California before. 
Um, so anyway, I'll pull it out to some degree. Uh, it's about six feet long, the specimen overall. It gets the name frill shark from these gill slits here that are, well, frilly. Um, you can see the, the way they are. But the teeth are amazing. They actually come out onto the outer jaw here. The jaw is a bit distorted in this specimen, but you can kind of see what they look like. And again, they're in rows so that there are always replacements. Uh, this is a very unusual, unusual fish. And you can see it's very long and eel-like. Again, another view of those, um, the gill slits from where the common, it gets its common name. But yeah, this is the first specimen recorded from California, 1948. There was a lot of play in the newspapers about it, um, calling it a sea monster, et cetera, et cetera. And some of these, um, I've got a folder from when uh, we received the specimen back when a curator here named Bill Follett was working. And uh, there's some wonderful Photographs. <laughs> there we go. Old black and white photographs. Um, there's the the entire specimen. Uh, you can kind of get an idea there of how long and slender it is. There was a little article in this Science Illustrated magazine. So some of these older um, accession folders have a lot of interesting information in them. There's another one, five foot sea monster. <laughs> and uh, the shot here of the, uh, of the shark with its jaws propped open. And again, more newspaper coverage and photographs. This is a former curator here really in Dempster holding the specimen. So. And then uh, another shot looking at the, the dentition. Anyway, some of these older accession folders have a lot of very interesting information in them. So at this point, let's see. This is an interesting one. This is an example of a lantern shark. And they're called lantern sharks because they're luminescent. Again, these are the lantern sharks are small, generally small species, and um, uh, this, it, I mentioned it at the beginning of, the, of this segment that um, the smallest shark, not any longer than eight inches, is a it's one of these lantern sharks. Same genus as this one, Etmopterus perii. This is Etmopterus lucifer. Uh, and this is uh, these lantern sharks, as I said, are luminescent. Um, and they have photophores on this ventral surface here. So, again, another interesting, uh, interesting specimen, interesting shark species. Can you um, show where the kind of luminescent part of the shark, like what part lights up or? There, it's actually, it's hard to actually see the distinct okay. photophores, but there, it's all through this ventral surface here. Oh. 
Um, you, you can't really tell that much from just looking at the specimen like this. Yeah, um, cool. But uh, but these are luminescent. And that's partly the where the name Lucifer <laughs> comes from. Let's see. And I think we've seen most of the things that I brought here. Oh, I, I know. I'd mentioned the second largest um, fish is a basking shark, and I showed you the basking shark jaws. Well, I happen to have a vertebrae from a basking shark, and this is uh, this is it. There's my my hand next to it for comparison. Um, so, wow. There's the edge. This is again the from the um, second largest fish, and second lot and second largest shark as well. Um, the uh, basking shark, uh, Cetamimus maximus. I guess at this point, are there any questions? Hey, Dave. Hi. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for any questions. Oh, there's a little bit of an echo for some reason. We'll figure that out. Anyway, um, thanks so much for doing that tour uh, for us. Uh, we have a bunch of questions, so um, so let's get started. Um, I also like when you say, um, "I just happen to be hold. I just happen to have a vertebrae right here." You know, most people <laughs> probably do. Anyway. Um, so first question is, uh, what's the fixative solution in the jar? And um, how many years can fish be preserved? Um, pretty much about three quarters of our collection, the entire collection, is stored in uh, ethyl alcohol, ethanol, at um, about 70 to 75 percent. Um, we do have a portion of the collection that's is stored in isopropanol at about 50%. And that was a very large collection that we acquired in the late 1960s that came to us in isopropanol. There's about 40,000 bottles from that collection. So mm -hmm. it's easier for us just to buy the occasional barrel of isopropanol and um, top off those jars rather than switch them. And there's also kind of the, the question is open whether shifting from one alcohol to another does any damage to the specimen. Mm -hmm. So that's still kind of an open question. Um, people are also worried about your hands. Are, are you, are your hands okay after you're reaching in and grabbing um, frill that's, sharks that's, out? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, every, these days people have been using hand sanitizer that's like 70% alcohol. So it's, um, it's not that bad. <laughs> not that um, it bad. keeps okay. my hands disinfected. <laughs> Although when I when I am handling some of our larger sharks in some of our vats, um, they generally tend to have um, large livers that are quite oily, and frequently mm -hmm. the alcohol gets oil slicks on top. And sometimes there, your hands kind of come out smelling a little mm. interesting. <laughs> so you yeah. got to wash them a bit. But uh, but yeah, by and large, it doesn't really do much. Okay. Um. And this is an interesting question. So why do all sharks jaw museum specimens have their jaw angles stiffly fixed? Um, is there a way to preserve jaw mobility for museum collections? Um, well, usually the, the jaws that have been excised from a specimen and dried like that, those are the ones I've been showing you. But we do have, I mean, uh, not for some of the really large species, but for a lot of shark species, as ones I was showing there, we have wet specimens in alcohol. Mm. And in those, the, the jaws are, um, well, you can open them and, and um, move them. There are move, movable there. And we could conceivably dissect some out and keep them in alcohol, and they would um, retain some, some movement. Um, but by and large, if we've got the jars cut out, then they're dried and they're in the skeletal collection. 
Uh, so that's kind of why they're fixed. But um, okay. they are present in the in the um, wet spe wet hole specimens. Yeah. Um, and then moving on to um, sort of when you were talking about different shark reproduction, and everyone was very very enamored with those mermaid purses. They're beautiful. Um, but Christopher wanted to know how does the female horn shark screw the egg case in with no hands? It bites the end of it with its mouth and then kind of can spin around a little bit. Is the whole shark spinning? The whole shark's or? kind of moving, yeah. Oh, and so the whole shark can kind of move around and just kind of drive the thing into a crevice. Corkscrew shark, yeah. Um, and then how are the eggs fertilized once, once they're laid? Well, the eggs are fertilized prior to that. Um, mm. Sharks, uh, Male sharks have a pair of what they call claspers that are adjacent to the um, pelvic fins. And those actually, the, the males and females copulate. And those claspers are used to, um, to deposit sperm into the female. And so, and shark reproduction can get, I didn't really go into this in the, in the talk, but shark reproduction can get a little bit violent and you'll frequently see photographs of it where a male is actually just literally bitten up, biting a female to hold her in place while, while they're copulating. And you can see females with a lot of scars from, from matings. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so the, the, um, the fertilization occurs early on and then, uh, and then those several methods that I was talking about then kind of go from there. Yeah. Um, and then moving on to dentition, uh, Kirsten wants to know, is it uncomfortable? Do we know if it's uncomfortable at all for sharks to essentially be teething all the time? <laughs> That's an interesting you know? question. I haven't really yeah. thought about that. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, sharks will bite a lot of things uh, and teeth will break off. And I can't say if that hurts much. I mean, I can imagine, you know, you break a tooth, a human breaks a tooth in it can hurt. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know exactly how know. sharks feel that, but yeah. their jaws are designed that way to constantly replace the teeth that are that are damaged and lost. And then finally, um, hazards of your job. Have you ever cut yourself on teeth while you were moving around, you know, great white shark jaw? Um, occasionally that can happen, yeah. Okay. <laughs> You can get yeah. bitten, bitten by a dead shark. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, that's a great way to end this. Thanks so much for doing that amazing tour and for um, coming on to do some Q and A with us. So, uh, my pleasure. pleasure. Okay. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, Kristen. <laughs> yeah. Bye, Dave. Bye. All right. Up next, we have Dr. Sora Kim. Hi, how's everyone doing? Um, I'm excited to join you. I'm also keeping up with the shark attire theme here. Uh, and I want to share with you uh, one of my favorite artistic pieces it says cool shark show. And that really embodies the theme of today. And one of the reasons why I really love this piece by Ray Troll is because it's really showing you the diversity of sharks, not just today that we sort of got to see with Dave there in museum specimens, but also ancient sharks. We have um, really crazy sharks like Helicoprion with its sawtooth uh, whirl, and then also Megalodon, um, the giant shark that is um, essentially the size of a whale shark today. And so um, I'm actually trained as a geologist though, and geologists, we like to think about geologic time. And geologic time isn't um, a lot of modern ecologists, we think about time in sort of the, the 10 years, 20 years, historical could be in the hundreds of years, but I actually like to start thinking about things in um, the, the tens of millions of years or 100 million years slices. And so here is the geologic time scale. Another piece by Ray Troll, and you can see that it starts at the bottom um, when the Earth formed, and then sort of marches through time to the present at the top. And sort of on the other side, I'm showing you um, diversity of different uh, vertebrate groups, and there's little silhouettes that show you different um, the 
different clades. And I've highlighted in teal where sharks lie. And so, you know, you can look at um, the fish, amphibians and reptiles, birds, and mammals and see that, um, that some of them might be more diverse, which is shown in the width of the, the shape. But um, sharks have been really, really good at what they do. They evolved in the late Silurian or Devonian is when we have the earliest records of them. And uh, they sort of have this bottleneck at the Permian-Triassic border. Um, but otherwise, they do fine. Uh, I have highlighted various extinction uh, events with these gold stars. And uh, you probably know and love, let's see here, does my pointer work? Um, yes, um, you probably know and love sort of the Cretaceous um, uh, tertiary boundary here when dinosaurs got taken out and it really does not affect sharks at all. In fact, um, they seem to pass through unscathed. And so sharks, um, they are predators in the oceans, sort of at the um, middle um, predatory level, meso predators, all the way to apex predators, which you might think of as white sharks, and um, and they've done very well for themselves. And that's pretty cool because it turns out that the geologic past has all of these past experiments. You can think of them. Uh, one of those time slices that we really like to think about in relation to modern day climate change is the Eocene, which is one of these. Uh, orange slices here. And the Eocene had really high concentrations of CO2, sort of like what we have going on right now, um, and it was very warm. And because it was so warm, sharks could actually survive all the way from the Arctic to the Antarctic. Uh, this map here at the bottom, it's from the paleobiology database. It's where paleontologists go in and sort of catalog and mark where uh, all the various fossils that they found are. And at the red star uh, is the Arctic. And um, this is a site called Banks Island. And the Arctic Ocean today, uh, it's covered with ice, at least for part of the year, although that seems to be uh, decreasing. But to get at marine signals, uh, you have to send in a boat, which you can see here, with a big coring rig. And then you can take these long sediment cores, which we use to extract information about past environments um, and climate. But on the islands, there's actually a lot of fossils. And shown right under the boat is a fossil shark tooth um, from a, a fossil shark uh, called the sand, it's a type of sand tiger shark. And this is probably from about 50 to 30 million years ago. And we have something like 13,000 shark teeth from Banks Island, it turns out. And they are all sand tiger sharks, uh, except for something like six teeth. Six teeth of all 13,000 are, um, are some other taxa, but otherwise it's sand tiger sharks all the way. And uh, I want to give you an idea of just what the environment looked like. We don't necessarily have an artist rendition of the, the marine environment, but for the terrestrial environment, we think that it was a sort of lush temperate forest, which is depicted here. This is a Corypidon, it's a hippo-like mammal that's hanging out. Um, and then we have some, uh, some uh, mammals swinging through the trees and in the underbrush. And you can see that it looks very, very different than what you might picture the Arctic Ocean to look like today. And so what can we do with something like 13,000 teeth, right? Um, surely there must be some information in there, but how can we extract it? Today, to study sharks, we uh, can catch sharks, which you can see here. Um, someone's catching a shark to put a satellite tag on it. You can um, observe sharks. Uh, folks oftentimes will sample different tissues from sharks and try to get at different uh, patterns um, in their chemistry. But the chemistry is also encoded in their teeth as well and can tell us something about um, about their past. And so for fossil shark teeth, Dave just showed you all these specimens and you can even see that in a single shark, there are hundreds, if not thousands of shark teeth, especially over its lifetime. And so when you go to a museum, if you ask for some fossil shark teeth, they usually just hand you like an entire box. And, um, and I have an example of that here. But if you look at these fossil shark teeth, a lot of them actually resemble what we see in modern teeth. 
And so the very center photo here is um, an, the ancient sand tiger shark from the Arctic Ocean, but just to the side of that is actually a modern sand tiger shark, Carcarius taurus. And so you can see that the resemblance in these teeth is very, very similar. And then in the bottom row here, uh, I am showing you various things related to the chemical composition. Uh, usually we um, measure the stable isotopes is what I uh, specialize in, in terms of my technique. We measure stable isotopes in little microscopic organisms or in um, bivalve shells, but it's also these same chemical composition are also stored within the chemical structure of the teeth. And so for us, we have enamel on the outside of our teeth, and then you have dentin. The dentin has lots of organic material in it, and it does not preserve so well in the fossil record. But your enamel, it does preserve quite well because it is actually a mineral structure. And sharks do something really um, different from, um, from mammals in that their teeth actually have a lot of fluoride in them, which allows them to preserve really well. And so you go to the, we go to the dentist um, and you get the fluoride painted on your teeth and it's all mossy feeling. And the idea is, is actually trying to make your teeth more like shark teeth and put more fluoride in your teeth so that they're stronger. And so um, who knows, maybe in 50 million years, there'll be a lot of human teeth preserved because we've turned it all into a flora appetite. So, um, so I've told you a little bit about stable isotopes and uh, that's, I study and in the top here I show you different molecules of carbon. You may have heard of carbon-14 dating which is um, a radioactive decay and means that we can actually look at how old different materials are. There are actually um, two other types of carbon. Carbon-12 is the most common and then carbon-13 is um, it's also fairly common. It's about 1% of all carbon on Earth. And while it has the same number of protons, because protons are what um, determine what atom it is, that it has different number of neutrons. So carbon-12, which is the most abundant, has six neutrons, whereas carbon-13 has seven neutrons. And so when you have these differences of carbon-12 and carbon-13, they actually interact differently within environmental or ecological processes. And as an example, in the bottom here, I'm actually showing you uh, results of salinity. So salinity is related to um, oxygen isotopes. Oxygen is in water, and we can have water in the oceans, which is very homogeneous. Um, it has a composition close to um, zero. But then the water that falls on land, either as snow or rain, it actually has a different composition. And, um, and when the seawater and the water from land mix, then um, you get a difference in salinity, but also in oxygen isotope composition. So we can predict what the salinity was in the past uh, from these oxygen isotope compositions. And so in this graph here, um, in blue, I'm showing what the um, estimated salinity would be for sand tiger sharks caught in Delaware Bay. Um, modern day sand tiger sharks, and we know what type of habitat they live in, but this is a prediction based on the oxygen isotope composition of their teeth. And then in white are um, data from fish bones, and these fish bones were from the ship that you saw earlier that was taking the big sediment core from the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Um, and from uh, about 53 million years ago, the um, Lomonosov Ridge, where that ship was uh, taking the sediment core from, predicted a salinity of about 22. And then the sharks that we found on Banks Island, they actually give us a salinity of close to 12, which is really odd. Today, sand tiger sharks, they really live in completely marine habitats. But these are Arctic sharks that were living in water that in California, a salinity of 12 would be, um, if you're familiar with the Bay Area in Susan Bay, so pretty 
far apart, like even further upstream than the San Francisco Bay. And if you're on the East Coast, you might be more familiar with um, like the Gulf of Mexico area and in the New Orleans area, there's Lake Pontchartrain. And so that's the salinity that we're talking about. It is really, really uh, freshwater dominated habitat when you get to um, a salinity of about 12. And so we're still sort of digging into this, but uh, it looks like sharks in the past really could live in very different environments, which probably bodes well for them in terms of uh, climate change, environmental change that's to come. Another example that's pretty uh, enigmatic is from the Antarctic. So today, the Antarctic, uh, you can see in this map, it has the Antarctic um, circumpolar current. It's this current that goes all the way around Antarctica and sort of keeps Antarctica uh, thermally isolated, so it's cold, like really, really cold. Um, but in the past, in the Eocene, it was actually also very warm. And we have found fossils, uh, specimens of things like sea stars and penguins. Um, and also, yet again, our friend, the sand tiger shark. And one question related to Antarctica because Antarctica is really key to our current climate system with this circumpolar current, was when did Antarctica and South America actually separate? And when did this Antarctic circumpolar current actually form? And we have not been able to really um, solve this question yet. And we, again, sort of like the Arctic, we actually have hundreds of teeth. Um, different uh, shark teeth from Antarctica, from Seymour Island. It's this little island um, near the Antarctic Peninsula. And with these teeth, they almost act as ancient data buoys that are collecting information from the environment that they are swimming through. And so what can these ancient data buoys tell us? So when we look at the stable isotope composition, we can um, actually match it to uh, climate models that have been um, simulations that have been done by other scientists. And what we found was that the isotope composition from the shark teeth, that it almost exactly matches with estimates of uh, when CO2 concentrations were three to six times what they are today. And the temperatures of the waters are like in the 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. So pretty warm, much warmer than the waters that we find um, off of California today, even in the warmest of days. The other thing that you can tell from these teeth is the body size. And so it, with sharks, they produce so many teeth. And it turns out that when sharks are babies, they produce babies, small size teeth. And when they're bigger, they actually produce larger teeth. And so if you actually measure the height of the tooth, you can get at how big the shark was. And you might imagine in places where it's maybe colder, the sharks may be smaller, or in places where there's not as much to eat, the sharks will be more resource limited. And so uh, with these sharks in Antarctica, but also in the Arctic, um, myself and some students, we measured the height of the teeth to try to reconstruct how big the sharks were from the Arctic and the Antarctic. And for the Antarctic, we were really surprised from Seymour Island because the waters are very warm, but we actually find that the, uh, the climate or the oceanography is changing, um, that the Antarctic, that the uh, space between uh, the Antarctic Peninsula and South America, the Drake's Passage is probably widening and that there's through flow of water. And so as this current is changing, you would think that the environment is changing, but from these shark teeth, it actually looks like that the size of the teeth is staying exactly the same. So we think that probably the um, sedimentary packages in Seymour Island represent something like 20 million years and uh, different layers are called telms there. And we have telms two, three, four, and five. And you can see that the pattern really doesn't change. It stays pretty constant throughout this entire period of time. And so sharks aren't really changing in terms of their body size uh, in this really light gray uh, dotted line that you can see faintly in the background, that's actually the body size distribution in Delaware Bay. And so um, the sharks 
that were in Antarctica, actually, there were some sharks that were smaller than the sharks that we're seeing in Delaware Bay. And then there were other sharks that were actually bigger than what we see today in Delaware Bay, which is kind of interesting. Um, and so, yeah, the range in body size is actually way greater than today's Delaware Bay. And there's been no change in 20 million years. And so then I kind of alluded to this before, but how do environmental factors affect sand tiger body size? And so here is the map of the distribution of sand tiger sharks and on it are various colored stars and the colors of these stars match up to the colors of the lines here. These are all sand tiger sharks from the Eocene, so similar time periods. I have sharks that were in low salinity water shown in green and then sharks that were in fully marine water shown in blue. And so you can see that the sharks that are in low salinity water, they are actually smaller. And then the sharks that are in blue are larger. So they are probably the large, the, in fully marine areas. And oftentimes this is what we think about um, sharks in, in nursery habitats today that they will go to nursery habitats that are more inland, um, that there's protection from predation there and lots of resources. And so they'll hang out sort of in these estuarine areas. And then as they get bigger, they move into marine areas. What's really interesting um, to me in, in this figure is that these high latitude sites, the Arctic and the Antarctic, they're warm, but they're, um, they are still dark, you know, for a good chunk of the year. And despite it being dark and therefore probably photosynthesis is limited, these sharks are still able to survive quite well. And even in Antarctica, which is uh, the dark blue line here, you can have some really large sharks actually. Um, and so that is something that we do not necessarily see today. There are no sharks in, uh, in Antarctica. In the Arctic, we have the Greenland shark, but that's it. Um, so with that, uh, I will conclude. Um, I guess my main takeaways here are that shark teeth are encoded with environmental information in their chemistry and then ecological information about body size from their tooth height. And the Eocene was really this really interesting time where we had warm waters, really wide distribution of sand tiger sharks, and we could use all of these thousands of shark teeth that are in the fossil record to tell us something about what um, these sharks were doing. Um, and then to close, I would just like to give a plug that if you are in middle school or know of a middle schooler who is interested in sharks, uh, my research group is actually putting on a two week summer program for middle schoolers from June 7th to 18th. And you can go to this bit.ly link to get more information to register um, the, for the two weeks, it's $40, but we also have waivers. So feel free to email me if you want more information. Thank you. Hi, Sora. Um, that was really fascinating. Um, also, sorry if the music gets loud. It's it's starting to get loud in here, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, but we do have a bunch of questions. Um, the first one is, you were talking about, um, in kind of the first few slides, you had the chart of extinction events. Um, and sharks seemed like they kind of passed, you said they passed through an ex the extinction event unscathed. Um, why do you think sharks were able to do that? I actually think that sharks are quite good at um, changing things up. Uh, and so they're, they're quite plastic, you might say, in that they can uh, change what they're eating, they can swim to new habitats. They're really, I think, capable of um, morphing into a lot of, different ecological niches. And so um, sharks are also, they're ectothermic, you know, they're not warm blooded, so they don't actually require that much energy. Uh, we have some sharks that might be mesothermic that have the ability to sort of uh, retain some heat and swim longer or faster, like the white shark, the salmon shark, um, the mako shark, but in reality, most of them are ectothermic. And so for my PhD dissertation, um, I actually kept sharks in captivity because I was trying to figure out some of the biological parameters related to stable isotopes. And 
I would have sharks go on hunger strike and not eat sometimes for weeks. And so they couldn't be part of my study because I was like, I need you to eat here. But um, wow. yeah, sharks, I think uh, they're capable of some pretty awesome things. Um, speaking of which is all the fluoride. Um, me and Christina were saying in the background how we'd like the shark shark treatment from our dentist just so we can maintain our teeth. Um, but um, with all the fluoride, how much do you estimate like a shark tooth changing or deteriorating over like 50 million years? Like how different is it? Oh, uh, for the enameloid, which is their version of enamel, it's the same. Um, there might be small differences in various trace elements that get taken up during the early processes of fossilization. But in terms of um, a lot of the, the mineral structure is held in place, is held tight there. And so, uh, yeah, the floral appetite of shark teeth, it's uh, quite strong and their enameloid is very thin but it just perfectly preserves them. And that's why we have so many shark teeth. Um, almost everyone that I meet is like, oh yeah, I love fossil shark teeth. I go look for fossil shark teeth on the beach with my grandma or, or my cousins or whatever. And so um, they're really good at preserving in the fossil record. Cool. And how easy was it to find a shark tooth in the Arctic or Antarctica? I actually haven't found any of these teeth. Uh, sort of. Folks like Dave are who I rely on a lot of times. Um, it turns out that people love collecting shark teeth and then they'll hand them over to a museum um, or they'll be like, for the Antarctic, there's a lot of scientific expeditions that have gone into the Antarctic. And so the National Science Foundation has already invested a ton of money in sort of folks going to Antarctica and collecting these shark teeth and putting them into museums. And so, um, the jackpot is when you know the person that actually did collect the teeth. Uh, what I mostly do is I, I spend my time a lot in the lab doing chemistry. So um, that's sort of the less glamorous part, part of it. <laughs> um, have any sharks ever lived in semi-terrestrial habitats? Um, I know that there aren't any around today, but could there have been land sharks? Oh, not that I know of. I mean, sharks are, I mean, they're, they're type of fish. Yeah. I mean, this is really terrifying to think about. Um, and, uh, and there are sharks that, you know, that their, their fins are, are what like hold them up and they're more benthic. I mean, there's the skates and rays, but there are also sharks that actually have fins that they sort of use to, to move along the bottom. I don't know many that can actually live on land because they really do need to get their oxygen from the water um, going over their gills. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing then. Um, <laughs> how were kind of going more into specifically the sand tiger sharks, um, how were they so successful and what other species were around back then and are their ancestors still around today? Yeah, so um, sand tiger sharks, they really, uh, they're not the glamorous shark, you know, today. Uh, they're in a lot of museums. They have these crazy teeth that stick out really. Um, and so they look very ferocious. But, um, and we do have several species of sand tiger sharks today, but they seem to just really be prolific within uh, the fossil record. Uh, there were other sharks around in uh, the Antarctic. There's, I think, something like almost 40 species of sharks. And there's even um, various rays that we have teeth from as well. And so for that project, uh, we are actually now moving from the sand tigers and now analyzing other sharks' teeth. And so sharks, you know, some of them like to migrate, some of them live near the bottom, some of them live more at the surface ocean in the pelagic zone. And so we're actually analyzing all of these shark teeth and trying to reconstruct what um, like a cross section of the ocean would look like based on what habitat, corollary habitats they would be in. But um, yeah, there are a lot of sharks. Uh, I, I can't say that I can pronounce all their names quite frankly. Uh, and so we, one of the things that I do in my work of trying to bridge sort of the modern and the paleo 
is to find a modern analog for these ancient sharks. And so say that like, well, the form of the teeth is very similar in the modern and the paleo here. And so they likely had similar aspects to their lifestyle. Very cool. Um, well, thank you so much, Sora, for being on. Um, I think Christina dropped a link for the two week summer program in the chat. So if you're interested, the links, the links over there or there, I don't know which way. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Sora. It was really interesting. And this was fun chatting with you. Yes. Um, Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Misty Peg Tran. Hello there, everybody. Hopefully you are all enjoying the show and uh, having fun. I'm definitely learning a lot. I love Dr. Uh, Sora and all her work. It's amazing. So um, with that, hopefully I can anchor the show and keep it going for you. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, actually, both of the presentations today alluded a little bit to what I'm gonna be talking about, which is the filter feeding sharks. And also I'm gonna include some rays in there. Um, I did stay with the shark theme and I have my manta ray today on my, um, on my necklace, so enjoy. All right, to begin with, let me just go ahead and introduce you to who I am and what I do. Um, I am uh, essentially a marine biologist who is specialized in a field called biomechanics or comparative biomechanics, because really what I do is I look across different animals. Uh, a biomechanist is actually someone who can join a couple different dif disciplines. So mostly I'm interested in anatomy and physiology. You might've heard the terms form follows function or form predicts function. Um, and then I, I really blend that with other disciplines like biology uh, and then physics and even surprisingly engineering. And I use these techniques in order to ask questions primarily about performance in animals. In my case, this happens to be um, primarily sharks, but I also work in other systems. I've worked with piranhas. I'm working with um, giant fin whales right now. So lots of different systems can, can, um, you can take a look at with biomechanics. Uh, to get a little bit more specific, so you know where I'm going with this, particularly my lab studies bioinspiration and biomimetics. And that is probably a little bit abstract at the moment, but I'm hoping that um, this talk will help you get there. Uh, what that actually means is I study nature or natural events, um, and I then try to look to nature for inspiration for new tools for humans. So you are absolutely familiar with this, at least the, the product of this with Velcro. So Velcro actually came from plant burrs and the way that it works. Um, we looked to that, we studied those burrs, and then we created these new uh, technologies which help you to um, you know, stick things on the wall now and all kinds of different applications. Uh, it can be used across things like um, soft robotics, which you're seeing in, with the elephant there, or even now is being used in things like architecture. So looking to bird bones and how they're very, um, lightweight, but still structurally sound. And so that allows us to create actually um, buildings that are based on these designs that won't uh, just crumble and fall during our California earthquakes. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. Let's be honest, you're here for the carnage. And I am gonna try to provide you with that, even though you're thinking, how the heck are you gonna do that with filter feeding sharks? But don't worry, I'm gonna get there. Um, and this was just the picture that I could give you that showed you the most carnage from what I ever do. This is a six scale shark that I caught up, uh, well, it actually stranded up in uh, Washington. And that's me carving its head with a really big knife that, that was just there for show to scare people. And so I'm glad that it finally got some use in this picture. All right, so let's talk sharks and specifically let's talk about sharks uh, killing things, right? And so, um, this is the 2020 stats actually for shark attacks on humans. And so part of the reason I'm showing this is to show you that in 2020, if we just look at these unprovoked attacks, which means shark bites that the shark really 
it came in out of nowhere, we'll say, and and bit a person rather than somebody pulling a shark up and harassing it or doing something that would cause an animal to bite back. 57 unprovoked attacks. And so, um, you know, worldwide, 57 attacks, there's, you know, my cat probably bites me more than 57 times, um, you know, in a week. Um, he's over here rolling down by my feet. So I used him as an example, but they're not very prevalent. There's not very many of them. When you think about the fearsome uh, man-eating sharks, right? We think about these big bulbous sharks, uh, the great white, which is the third largest shark in the ocean. Uh, we had great um, shark teeth earlier. Um, but if you look at this uh, figure, this is from 1580 to present and how many fatal attacks there were from each of these four fearsome sharks. And you see that with great whites from 1580 to present, 52 fatal attacks known fatal attacks that we can say, yes, that was definitely a white shark. And, and this is the result. Uh, oceanic white tips, three. I'm not including the USS Indianapolis there. And that's because we know that there was, um, you know, lots of shark bites happening, but it's very hard to piece together how many people actually died from the shark bite versus how many people were, were eaten later. Um, tiger sharks, 34. Bull sharks, which I consider the grumpiest shark in the ocean, 25. So really, um, these are terrible stats, obviously. Nobody wants to go out this way, but they're really not something that um, is likely to happen to you, even if you spend a whole bunch of time in the ocean. I certainly do. And I've never been bitten by a shark, but I've certainly gotten hit by a stingray before, and it was my fault. So let's get into who the real fearsome foes are. It's the filter feeders. These are the mega carnage sharks. And not mega carnage on humans. We already learned that you, if you get bumped by a shark, it's probably not gonna be these guys. They have very, very tiny teeth, albeit they have about 300 of them or so. Um, you know, I have been uh, basically inside of a whale shark's mouth before and I'm perfectly fine. I'm 5'3", it didn't do anything to me. Uh, but there are things that that they do prey on. So while we try to convince you that these are the most gentle giants, hear me out now, really, I'm gonna to try to convince you that they are, they are savage. So I know that none of you were probably expecting tonight to actually have to do math, but I am going to force you to do some math. So let's go ahead and take a look at the basking shark. And I picked the basking shark because it's the second biggest uh, shark in the ocean, uh, second to the whale shark, the whale shark being the first. And I picked that because I didn't want you to think that I was just going with the biggest and the baddest. And so the numbers were inflated. Instead, I picked number two. So hear me out. Size wise, we're looking at about 16 to 23 feet in size. So a massive shark. I'll give you that. They're filter feeders, which means that they get their food basically by opening up their mouth, swimming through a bunch of water, and then filtering out a bunch of organisms, in this case, plankton. So in order to figure out how much death and destruction they're able to cause on these little plankton, you have to know how much they're ingesting. And so in this case, 233,000 gallons per hour that they're actually filtering through. As far as plankton density, we have to know how many of these little organisms are in you know, a unit of space. We're at about 0 0.001 ounce per square foot. So really not a very heavy density of plankton at all. If you had you know, a shot glass, you wouldn't have very much in there. And so let's go ahead and do the math and say we're going to look at the water ingestion times the amount of the plankton density, plus we have to know about how much they're going to feed. So in some cases, they say they're feeding up to 12 hours um, in a day. I went ahead and scaled it back a little bit just so I can prove that I'm, I'm being fair and conservative with my numbers to eight hours a day. And so we get somewhere around 10,000 grams to translate that for you. It's about 22 pounds of plankton per day that they're eating which is a lot. I certainly can like chow down on double doubles and never hit 22 pounds, <laughs> but they do 22 pounds. But what does that actually mean? Let me introduce you to our, 
our prey here. This is a copepod. Um, they're very small plankton. The largest weigh about 100 micrograms. Um, so they're, they're teeny tiny. If we take the amount of um, that they're ingesting per day and we divide that by the size of this copepod, here it comes. I have to, to make this very, very theatrical. 100 million individual deaths per day. Oh, the horror. So hopefully here you're going, wow, these sharks are really just fearsome predators of the sea. 100 million deaths per day when I'm being conservative. And actually, uh, we know that at least for manta rays and probably also for whale sharks, they're actually feeding a little bit longer than that eight hours per day. So this number goes way up. Um, so what I really want to get to you is this makes the filter feeding sharks like yeah, the super mass murders of the sea, more so than the white sharks, than the bull sharks, than the oceanic white tips, than the tiger sharks, and even the great hammerheads, which I left off the big four, um, which certainly get a nod. But I'm only here to tell you a little bit about the carnage and more about how they actually feed because that's critically important. And remember I said I'm a biomechanist who's interested in bio-inspired design. So figuring out how this massive shark, in the case of a whale shark, we're talking about you know 40 feet, usually the ones I deal with are about 20 feet long, but they're eating some of the tiniest organisms in the sea. And it's not very intuitive how they would actually do that and do that um, effectively as they swim through and just have you know, a hundred, you know, hundreds of thousands of these happening per, per second, really, uh, filtering. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce you here to manta rays, if you don't know what those are. Um, so these are mantas. This is taken off of Hawaii. And what you can see there is that they're swimming through and opening up their mouth. And those all those little particles that are swimming through the screen are actually the plankton source that they're feeding on. And that's about the density we were talking about earlier. This is a little bit denser because there are um, dive lights in the water and then the planktons usually uh, swarm those dive lights. So we used to think let me get this back going again, there we go, that uh, they actually were able to catch all this plankton through a sieving mechanism. And so you are familiar with a sieving mechanism, what that is when you have your pasta and your water and you're ready to go ahead and separate the pasta, the solid, from the water, the liquid, you would strain it through something that would have lots of holes, the pasta would stay and the water would leave. And that makes intuitive sense and seems like a really good reason for, for you know, catching lots of these, these particles. And so this idea of them using a, a sieve filter um, persisted all through the uh, basically, you know, 20th century. And uh, I came in and asked the question of, OK, if that's true, two things would happen. They would probably clog because all sieves clog. and also why aren't they closing their mouth and swallowing more often, right? Because they they would be clogging otherwise, and there would be a lot of extra drag in the in the mouth. Lots of problems with that. So I set out to actually figure out how it is that these organisms do what they do. Um, the particles are just so tiny, and so here is a picture of a manta ray. This is about a twenty foot wingspan, if you can picture that. This is looking inside of the mouth at the gill rakers, which is the filter element of the organism. So the gill rakers are actually very dark. Um, you see those bars sort of going at sideways angles in the filter that are sitting um, in that dark spot where um, in between those bars. And all those tiny little dots are actually the plankton. So they're teeny tiny. And it turns out that the plankton are actually smaller than the pore size of the filter. So if you imagine your colander, now imagine trying to strain out something like rice from a colander, a bunch of particles would be lost if you had a colander that had fairly large pore size, if, at least if the pore size was bigger than the particles that um, were remaining. So this just, you know, this theory really didn't hold up when you started to really examine it. Um, you know, one of the things that you can do is you can look to the anatomy. And so this is a cartoon of what one of those filters look like. The second part of the cartoon is actually um, uh, 
histology. So this is a way that we can sort of cut into a filter and stain it with different stains and see what it's composed of. Um, and so when I looked at the filter, this is an actual picture of the filter, I started to think, you know, it's not that they're using the, these colanders, but instead maybe they're using mucus, right? My daughter, she loves the uh, Princess and the Frog, and they are all about mucus in that um, that movie. And so I too was thinking, it's got to be mucus that, that they're using. And ah, uh, I solved the problem um, in the shark I was looking at. Um, in this case, it actually wasn't a shark. It, this this one here is Mobula terrapicana, which is one of the larger um, mobulid rays. Um, all these little um, holes there that you see that are kind of staining purple and uh, the second picture they stain sort of that teal color that's all mucosal cells so completely filled with this mucus material and I thought great I've solved the problem they're using mucus it makes sense that you would trap a bunch of tiny little particles um, in mucus I should keep looking and and try to figure out if this is across the board and so lo and behold I found three of the mobulid rays that did use mucus. Great. And then I had two that I actually couldn't get because they weren't available in museums, but I thought no problem. If these three do, then these two probably do too. Until I started looking a little closer and I found that really the three sharks didn't have any mucosal cells and a bunch of the mobulid rays didn't have mucosal cells. So, Okay, back to the drawing board. What you need to do then is essentially uh, test it in person, right? Uh, so I did go out to Mexico, took a look. Here is some video from Mexico of me trying desperately to get a camera inside of a manta ray's mouth. This was all done under permits and safely. Um, and you see that that manta ray actually gets one look at me, kind of closes off its mouth and it, just really hauls out of there as fast as it possibly can. This happened over and over and over, in fact. Uh, manta rays really are not that sociable, and especially in Mexico. Um, you know, they are a different species than the Hawaiian manta rays. They're not so used to people swimming and diving and trying to look in the mouth, but it was pretty much impossible to look inside the mouth. Um, on the same trip, I was trying to look inside of whale shark's mouth, and I didn't include that video today, but basically the whale sharks just pushed me to the side um, and continued doing what they did. So sometimes when you try to look to nature and you try to figure out what's happening in a natural setting, it doesn't work. Um, but what does work is learning something about the anatomy and then recreating it in the lab. And in fact, that's what we did is, um, you know, we had these filters that we had from museum specimens because museum specimens are always the best place to start to learn about anatomy and we recreated them. So here are our recreations and down below is what the actual filters look like. So they um, are sort of lobulated. Some of them were smooth. Some of them had these denticles, which are actually <laughs> shark teeth all over the filter. And some of them like the one to the right have these little finger like projections. That's actually a manta ray right there. We ran these filters in a flume with some cameras to try to figure out what was going on. And this is a video from what we found. Um, the blue here is a dye stream um, for the water that's going over this. And you can see that down below, uh, let's see if I, there we go, have an arrow. There are these little cyclones, which is actually super cool and totally unexpected for what we thought was happening. Um, and I thought, this is amazing. We have cyclones. This must be something like cyclonic filtration. So there's a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Um, you know, this works by basically creating this um, recirculating centrifugal force that as it gets smaller and smaller, particles are spewed out to the sides so that it's filtering particles using the centrifugal force. Um, and as long as you can get that that um, cyclone into smaller and smaller sizes, you can get rid of small, smaller and smaller particles. Um, great. I actually at that point had gone on NPR and I talked about it and said, you know, they're using something that we've never seen in biology before. It's cyclonic filtration. It's amazing. Yada, yada, yada. And I felt really comfortable with things until I actually put some particles in the water. <laughs> um, so the next step was, of course, to test it again, because I'm a scientist. We all like to test things. We like to get validation. 
And this was by far my biggest failure and also my my biggest success with with these um, these videos. And actually, this was done by my grad student Raj Divi. So this is a huge thanks to him. Uh, we have these particles in there, and what you're seeing is that bouncing effect. Uh, so one particle comes in, it slams against the filter, and it essentially bounces. I like to think of this like um, you know uh, balls in in um, like a, we call it ricocheting right um, off of a solid structure back into the cross flow. Um, and so as we delve deeper into this, we found out that, okay, this is completely new type of filtration, not just for biology, but actually also for um, industry as well. And so we, we discovered a new type of filtration and this new type of filtration is happening at least in the manta rays. Um, and what I suspect right now, and I actually have a grad student that's working on this now is in whale sharks as well. So just to give you an idea of what's actually happening, so you have a very clear understanding and you can have coffee chat about this hopefully later because I'm very excited about it. Um, so those are our filters. Water and particles will just move in um, to the mouth. The water will start to deviate from the streamline and that happens naturally. Um, it happens because of a pressure differential and also just because water's moving through and it finds any way to escape. Um, as it does, the particles will start to follow that water downwards towards those filters. Um, and that little circle that showed up um, is actually uh, the vortex that we saw. And so you're probably wondering what happened to that vortex? Well, the vortex is there, but the particles don't actually get stuck in that vortex. Instead, what that vortex does is it closes off that pore size even further. And so if effectively it acts like a boundary layer that particles don't cross. So it moves past that uh, cyclone and then it hits that next uh, filter element and it ricochets back into that cross flow up above. And so it, it follows that bouncing effect over and over and over all the way back to the esophagus of the fish. That answered two questions. Why isn't it clogging? This mechanism doesn't clog. These particles have so much energy that when they bounce, they elastically recoil. And so there's no clogging that happens. Um, it also solves the issue of why weren't they closing their mouth um, as much and swallowing? Well, because they didn't have to clear the filter, all of these particles sort of nicely follow suit and march back towards the esophagus. So only when there is a big bolus of particles do you see a, a close of the mouth. And usually that's somewhere around every three minutes or so, um, more or less depending on the amount of plankton in the water. Um, so this is some of the computational fluid dynamics, which is a really fancy way of saying we did this with models. We then um, looked to computer models to try to validate and try to figure out the physics behind this, what's happening. Um, and so uh, we found that this is highly efficient. Um, the particles were about a fifth of the pore size of the filters themselves. So if it was sieve, they would have gone right through. Instead, they are caught and they're caught at almost 100%. So they are so highly efficient, self-cleaning sieves. Um, the pictures on the right-hand side are the two different orientations that these filters can be found. The red is the trajectory of the particle. The blue is the trajectory of the water. And then you'll notice on that, that very last one, there was one particle in all, of our, uh, in all of our tests that actually did get sucked into the vortex. And instead of getting spit out like the cyclonic filtration that you saw in a, a Dyson vacuum cleaner, it actually just stayed and trained basically forever um, until we stopped the experiments. Uh, so, I wanna leave you with why should you care about uh, this new filtration? Um, besides the fact that I hope I've convinced you that they really are little murder beasts. And so uh, 100 million prey per day dying, if that doesn't convince you that number one, they're the coolest of all the sharks, the filter feeders, um, but also that they do it in such a, an efficient manner that there really are imp implications for um, human driven applications. So specifically with microplastics, and that's what you're seeing there on the finger. Um, you know, microplastics are a real problem um, in our waterways, both in freshwater and in um, our saltwater. 
particularly here in California, and we don't have a good way to clean out the marine system from these microplastics. But um, we now have actually a patent that's pending, and hopefully it's going to go through in the next month or so, we're crossing our fingers, for a bio-inspired filter that actually can be optimized for collecting microplastics of different sizes. Um, what's great about it is you can sieve out microplastics, but again, there's clogging and there's a lot of energy to get rid of those clogs. And that's kind of what happens in wastewater treatments right now is there are giant sieves and somebody has to go and unclog those sieves. And so we're hoping that our technology that we learned from manta rays will actually um, be able to be implant, implemented into wastewater treatment and also things like fish screens that try to keep um, fish and their eggs out of certain waterways um, to help protect the fish. Um, and actually there's a group of engineers um, in Colorado right now that are using um, with our blessing, um, our technology to try to create those fish screens as well. So hopefully um, manta rays and whale sharks will change your life for the good at some point in your life um, and we can start to get rid of some of these problematic plastics. So with that I'd like to uh, thank you for having me and letting me anchor the show tonight and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Hey Misty, that was awesome. Hello. Um, hi, that was also you know terrifying right <laughs> that was just very scary all those i just heard like little screams of all the little plankton you know i'm glad the plankton were terrifying and not the mathematics <laughs> yeah. well thankfully that's what scares me for us yeah you did the you did the calculations for us so we just had to be like oh yes that is a lot of plankton um anyway um so so it's so first of all, you um, so you get to swim and try to stick cameras in, in Ray and Shark's mouths, but you also study like these mechanics and how something might be adapted to human life. So like, how did you get into that? Like how you, it seems like you get to do both, which is really cool, like be in the field, be in the lab. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm actually, I'm classically trained as a marine biologist over at Cal State Long Beach, so locally in California. Um, and, you know, I actually got into it by asking a question in a class that uh, my professor couldn't answer and it led me to my PhD. And then um, while I was sort of in my PhD, I realized that I am a person who really likes to ask a bunch of different questions and I'm never happy if I'm just working in, a, in one System. I have too many questions, and I think that is uh, probably very similar to most of the audience. Um, and so because I am a professor, as long as I can uh, get funding to, to look at the things I want to do, I basically get to drive my own research. And so that's that's how I get to go out in the field and, and do things in the lab. And, you know, the, the bio inspiration, that was all accidental. Um, when I was studying manta rays, that was the first thing I started with. Um, you know, I, I thought, oh, there's probably a use for this at some point. And that's how we, we got into it. And since then, the lab has evolved into things like armors or, um, you know, things for, for hearing and all kinds of different applications. Um, awesome. And it seems like with this, you know, you're saying how it could, you know, this new filter could maybe, um, you know, help filter out microplastics. So I guess, like, that would ultimately maybe in turn, like, help well, let's just see. Um, I'm trying to think of like how it could help the actual sharks, but I'm just going to like. Is there kind of like some sort of way that they could be like go back to the health of the ocean? Uh, well, definitely the health of the ocean yeah. of, of ridding ourselves of microplastics mm -hmm. in general. Um, it's a little bit harder to to sort of envision something that's going to be out in our coastal waters mm -hmm. picking up. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't quite gotten there with an application for that, but certainly in the waterways before it makes it out to the ocean. So if we can reduce those microplastics, which are, uh, I mean, just incredibly prevalent. One of the biggest things in the California ocean are actually um, little bits of tires from our freeways. Mm -hmm. And you don't think about it, right, is how much wear and tear is going out there. And then, you know, when we go out and we sample the water, because we do, uh, one of my grad students works on microplastics in actually commercial fishes, so in yeah. sardines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and she's just finding just just 
tons of, of tires and things. So, you know, just having even some, some way to, um, put in a filter at sort of the end of rivers and streams and things, um, could be hugely yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I hope, I hope so. Um, and so how, so what about larger plastics? So how do basking sharks and other large, um, rays handle like bigger plastic in the ocean? Yeah. So um, in general, they're pretty good about not ingesting just anything. Um, in <laughs> fact, one of the things I did when I was first working with whale sharks is I thought, okay, how am I going to film where these particles are going once I get my hand into the shark's mouth, right? <laughs> yeah. And so what I did was I took tuna fish, canned tuna fish, and I figured, okay, they really like tuny eggs. They're probably going to be fine with tuna fish. And I dyed it with food coloring, a, like a bright green color. And I thought, okay, I'm going to put the camera in and I'm going to see these particles and it's going to tell me exactly how these things work. And actually the whale sharks, right? Largest fish in the ocean. It was like, heck no. And so it actually, mm. as soon as I would try to throw, and this is only, you know, a few feet in front of its face, this tuna down their throat, they, it was bobbing and weaving and, you know, just adjusting. And so they actually, they have wow. pretty good chemo senses. They can smell things. They actually can see things. They have really, you know, it, it's a bus going through the water, but it is a dynamic bus that can sort of bob and weave. Um, that doesn't mean that they never swallow plastics. They certainly mm -hmm. could, but their esophagus is pretty small. It's, you know, about yay big. And wow. so they're not, they're not going to be swallowing major um, pieces of like, you know, cans or something. It's going to be more plastic bags. That would be kind of an issue that kind of squitch down. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I, you know, I really don't hear much about necropsies of these things. So like animal autopsies where they mm -hmm. go into the stomachs of, of them and find a bunch of bags. I'm sure it happens, mm -hmm. but I just, you know, I, I haven't seen any major sort of news or, or papers about that. Yeah. Huh. Um, Great question. <laughs> and then somebody was wondering about that, that presence of mucus that you found first, like did, was, was there any follow up on, on the mucus and is there a reason it was there in some rays and um, does it affect the fluid dynamics? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Great questions. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, so the, um, every one of the organisms that I showed you, they're pretty much all filter feeders, but they all feed on different types of plankton. So not the same plankton. And actually whale sharks and manta rays, they swim in the exact same waters in Mexico and they feed on completely different things. Yeah. And so they are actually able to dynamically change their filters to only catch the thing that they're looking for. Um, yeah. So the, the organisms that actually had the mucus are, um, they actually, I didn't mention it, but they actually have cilia on their filters as well to help move particles. And so um, it turns out that probably the particles that they're going after are probably much smaller. And so they need to get this sort of mucus um, entrainment. Um, yeah. It does affect the flow, certainly. It makes it more viscous, but um, the amount of flow that's actually going through their mouth, it's such high, what we call Reynolds number, which is basically a dimensionless number to, that tells us like, how stream lane or how much turbulence there is. And, and it's so turbulent inside of that mouth mm -hmm. that the mucus sort of sloughs off and get lost. But huh. um, yeah, I, I think there's something tricky going there, but you know, no, <laughs> nobody knows. We haven't, we haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah. Um, well, this is so exciting. And thank you so much for coming on and talking to us today. Like I think, a lot of people think about sharks in like a much different way, or at least the, you know, the filter feeding sharks. So, um, but also it seems like if you want to swim into a whale shark's mouth, it's harder than it, harder than it seems. <laughs> just don't do so, it. So they, they don't try. like it. And you, yeah, <laughs> turns out they're protected. So you know, a lot of paperwork. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 they, they don't like it. <laughs> yeah, don't do it. Um, all right. All right. Well, have a great night. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna bring back Lynn. Um, Hi. And also it looks like there's somebody on the floor named Joey whose birthday it is. So if you're happy still birthday, there, Joey. Joey. Happy birthday, Joey. And hi. Lots of hi. Time. Yeah. Hi. Um, also don't swim into manta ray mouths or try yeah, and no, 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 no mouths. No mouths. No mouths. 
Um, well, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. Uh, special thanks to Dave, Sora, Misty for joining us. Uh, next week, we are going to be exploring the cutting edge technology of coral reef research uh, from high res satellite images to detailed 3D reconstructions to remote controlled underwater microscopes. Um, we'll learn about several exciting projects and meet the scientists and engineers finding new ways to look at these critical and complex ecosystems. And you can stick a camera right up next to a coral and it won't mind. So yeah, yes. so people are getting very good images of corals from up close. Um, so uh, other nightlife events, if you want to look, it looks so beautiful now, now that the sun has gone down and our, and our hang out lighting here. is up. Um, I believe next the next uh, event is on June 10th and it's already sold out. So if you want to come by Nightlife, tickets are on sale for the June 24th event. Um, so snag them. Um, and then uh, in the meanwhile, we'll be here at night school and we don't sell out. There's room for everybody on YouTube and Facebook. Um, so your subscribe. Friends. Yeah, invite your friends. And subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And uh, yeah, we love being here with you. So thanks so much. And have a good night, everyone. See you next week.